In the Gospel of John, Jesus very clearly calls himself God. But can a historical case be made that we do have Jesus' authentic words in the Gospel of John? Well, according to one very prominent Christian apologist, the answer, unfortunately, is no. And I find that to be really problematic. In a recent question on the Reasonable Faith podcast, Dr. William Lane Craig was asked, Why does Dr. Craig omit John 14? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. From his writings on the self-understanding and presuppositions of Jesus, both in his articles and his books, Joshua and Canada. To which Dr. Craig responded, Well, the answer is very simple, Joshua. In doing apologetics, You can't just quote Bible verses at the unbeliever because he doesn't accept the Bible. He doesn't believe the New Testament. So far, so good. Merely reciting Bible verses to unbelievers just isn't going to cut it. But we do have ample evidence for the historical reliability of the Gospel of John. So why not talk about that? And so what you have to do is to appeal to sayings of the historical Jesus for which a good historical case can be made that these are what scholars call authentic words, words that actually reflect what the historical Jesus uh, said. And so that's why in my work, I focus on those sayings of Jesus for which a very good case can be made that these are authentic. And I claim that you can show that among the authentic words of the historical Jesus are claims to be the Jewish Messiah, the Son of God in a unique sense, and the divine human Son of Man prophesied by Daniel. But I don't think that you would be able to prove uh, these verses that Joshua mentions uh, from historical grounds. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never... Normally, I'm a huge fan of Dr. William Lane Craig, but I find this comment to be troubling on a couple of different levels. Ignoring the unique sayings in John's gospel only weakens our argument. The synoptics provide implicit evidence of Christ's deity, but nothing compares to the strong claims that Jesus makes about his own deity in the gospel of John. By disregarding this, we undermine our own case. Also, dismissing John's gospel sets a dangerous precedent. It suggests insignificance, which discourages future apologists from answering objections to its historical accuracy. This lack of challenge allows potential errors to go unchecked. Take, for instance, Bart Ehrman's recent claims on Alex O'Connor's podcast. He says that the author of the Gospel of John just completely fabricated Jesus' I am statements. Where Jesus starts calling himself God is the Gospel of John, our last source. And so, to my thinking, um, you have these sources of information about Jesus. So I've just laid out six, six sources, six pieces of information versus one. The six are all earlier than the one. It seems to me completely implausible that six authors would describe the sayings of Jesus knowing that he called himself God and neglect to mention that part. Hmm. <laughs> like that, that bit just isn't important enough to bring up. <laughs> the way I see it, there are two main problems here. I'm not sure why, if we agree that John's gospel was written decades after the events, that's entirely significant to its reliability. A document could be unreliable if it was written the day after, or it could be reliable if it was written at the end of a lifetime. This is just a total non sequitur from Ehrman. Also, Ehrman is just making a weak argument from silence regarding what he thinks Jesus definitely did not say. I've gone over why the argument from silence fails many, many times on this channel, but I'll be sure to link a video in the description answering Ehrman's objection in particular regarding the deity of Christ and the Gospel of John. If it's this kind of faulty reasoning that causes New Testament scholars to reject the words of Jesus found in the Gospel of John, then why cede the argument? Why not just call them out on their bad thinking skills and just say shenanigan. Here's the bottom line. What words of Jesus that scholars consider authentic are not the only words that can be logically proven to be genuine. The way New Testament scholarship examines history is highly flawed, leading them to unnecessarily limit what they deem authentic. We shouldn't completely disregard a source because of disagreements among scholars. We have every right to challenge the consensus of New Testament scholars if they demonstrate crummy reasoning skills like this. We don't need to let the Bart Ehrmans of the world intimidate us. So what are some of the reasons that we have to think that the author of John's gospel was honest, trustworthy, and close up to the facts? 
To begin with, the author of the Gospel of John repeatedly asserts that he personally witnessed the events he describes. He places special emphasis on seeing Jesus' crucifixion in John 1935. He confidently declares that he saw it happen, testifying to its truthfulness. Interestingly, we can find small yet significant details in John's Gospel that align with this claim of being an eyewitness. Take, for example, the account of the soldiers dividing Jesus' garments in John 19, 23-24. These details further support the credibility of John's first-hand testimony. Commenting on this passage, New Testament scholar J.B. Lightfoot notes how John demonstrates his detailed knowledge of Roman military practices. It was common for a group of four soldiers, known as a quaternion, to be assigned for night duty or as an escort, as described by Vigetius and others. Interestingly, when the other gospel writers mention the guard present at the crucifixion, they don't specify the number. They simply state that the soldiers divided Jesus' garments among themselves. However, John provides the actual number, but in an incidental manner. He doesn't explicitly mention the quaternion. Instead, he casually notes that the soldiers, after crucifying Jesus, divided his garments into four parts, giving each soldier a part. This information isn't highlighted or emphasized. It just naturally emerges within the narrative. John's own bold assertions about his truthfulness as a witness, strongly challenged the whole idea that he was deliberately writing in some sort of partially non-historical genre. It also refutes the idea that we are imposing our modern standards when we interpret his account as presenting literal factual information. Instead, John's clear statements reveal his intention to offer us a first-hand perspective on the life of Jesus. He wants us to see Jesus through his own eyes, and he provides a unique viewpoint on the events. And while he's claiming to be a witness, he casually shares straightforward facts that can be cross-checked by external sources. And this is just one of many. John also skillfully demonstrates an effortless precision in his extensive knowledge of various locations and their topography throughout his writings. For instance, he mentions Cana of Galilee, which Jesus descended downhill to reach Capernaum. Another example is Bethany beyond the Jordan, which he distinguishes from the more well-known Bethany near Jerusalem, accurately describing its proximity to the city as approximately two miles. The author also references Ephraim, situated near the wilderness, and provides specific dimensions for the Sea of Galilee, a detail not found in Mark's account. Furthermore, he depicts the view from Jacob's Well, which encompasses Mount Gerizim and the nearby fields of corn. The author's familiarity extends to the precise locations of the Pool of Siloam, in the Pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem. He also portrays Jesus walking in the Colonnade of Solomon, emphasizing that this covered walkway, protected by a wall, would have provided shelter from the winter winds during that time of year. Through these meticulously described details, the author establishes himself as a native intimately acquainted with the places he writes about. Again, these are just a handful of examples. John's Gospel also presents unique scenes and objects that are etched in the writer's memory. For instance, the loaves used in the feeding of the 5,000 were barley loaves. Only John gives us that detail. Or the pouring of the ointment on Jesus' feet before his crucifixion filled the house with its fragrance. Again, only John gives us that detail. Or during Jesus' triumphal entry, it was palm branches specifically that were strewn in front of him. And when Judas betrayed Jesus, it was nighttime. These specific details, like Jesus' seamless tunic and the wrapped headcloth in the empty tomb, further highlight the Gospel's eyewitness perspective. These details can't all be easily dismissed as mere fictional inventions. First of all, the genre of modern historically realistic novels didn't exist until 16 centuries later, and the abundance of specific details in the Gospel stands in stark contrast to the novels of the 1st and 2nd centuries, and that even includes the apocryphal Gospels. It's evident that the Gospel of John is a work of an eyewitness. The Gospel of John is far from being historically indefensible, and most of the arguments that are raised against it are pretty weak sauce. Now, what I provided for you here is just a very, very small evidence sampler. If you want to go in more depth, I highly recommend Dr. Lydia McGrew's book, The Eye of the Beholder. She goes through objection after objection made against John's reliability, and she provides a robust positive case that is definitely well worth your time. I also recommend Craig Blomberg's book that defends the historical reliability of John as well, and I'll give you a link in the description down below for both books that you can pick up on Amazon. Now, don't get me wrong, I do think an interesting case can be made that Jesus understood himself to be God just using the synoptics. But ask yourself the question, why are you reflexively just bypassing the Gospel of John as an apologist? Why not just defend the reliability of the Gospel of John? When you're reading the Gospel of John, you do think you have Jesus' words, right? And I hope that you think that you have Jesus' words, not just based on some sort of theological supposition, such as inerrancy. You should have historically compelling reasons to think that you're reading Jesus' words. And so 
I don't think that we should see this ground to the critics, especially when we have an embarrassment of riches for the reliability of this book. And so I hope that you found this video helpful and thank you so much for watching.